Um, I'm gonna quickly pop open my chat and I am going to try to see the questions. I think I'll just uh, pop in a quick note on time. Um, I think in the P6 event page, we did say that it would end at 6.15. And, um, but <laughs> I think Aditi's sharing was so awesome. Um, it's actually almost time. So um, I think I just wanted to say if anybody needs to leave at 6.15, um, by all means. Um, but perhaps for the Q&A part, we can extend the call. For those of us who want to stay, we extend the call by another 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but if anybody needs to leave on time, um, please do. I apologize, Mike. <laughs> way too long um oh but it's all great stuff <laughs> okay um okay thank you sangeeta i'm quickly just going to read okay so th these are some great questions um mango has asked i love this name um does hybrid only happen within the same species uh yes um, just the way plant genetics works. As far as I understand, I'm not a plant scientist, but from my experience, um, a hybrid will happen across species. It's kind of like, not to be crass, but like we would not be able to, to fertilize another mammal, right? So even though we're all mammals, humans can just fertilize each other. So it's the same thing, um, uh, same concept, but just plants. Um, can someone breed a tomato and a corn? So no, um, you couldn't do that unless you're doing a genetic modification. So you can take a trait from corn and then insert it into tomato. But um, usually you're taking a singular trait. Um, I'm not familiar if now there's been multiple traits in the last few years. I haven't kept up with the science, but usually it's a singular trait. So like I said um, earlier, it, it could be a resilience to a type of pest that is inserted. Um, it could be um, um, drought resistance that is inserted, so or saline resistance. So that means it can take a lot of salt. That that variety can then take a lot of salt. Um, do farmers start their own list of hybrids, or is there a common list worldwide that they build upon? Um, not that I'm familiar with. That would be a great undertaking. Um, so the thing is, is a hybrid eventually can become a pure line, right? That is after you've bred it for at least nine to 12 generations and it has stabilized. Then when it's, if all the generations start to show the same, uh, successive generations start to show the same trait, then that means it's essentially a pure line because how else would you know something is a pure line, right? So you have to understand, even the heirlooms that we had, they actually originally came from the wild, right? So wheat, oats, barley, they were actually all wild grasses. And human beings, our ancestors, selected the grasses and the grains from those grasses that they liked. And they eventually developed into the strains of rice and wheat and barley that we eat now. So they would have been a hybrid at some point as well. We just don't know what time in history, right? So um, a hybrid can eventually become a pure line. I think that's also what your question is asking. Um, so the thing is, there are different, um, there's Via Campesina, there's a lot of organizations that are working internationally with farmers to try to, um, to collaborate and actually put together information of indigenous varieties. But like, again, there's, people are working in their own different corners. So I don't know if there's an all encompassing list. If you come across it, please share it with me. That would be very interesting for me. Um, given that we have limited access to space, is it still possible to embark on this journey? Um, I think that's a great question. The question is, given that we have limited access to space, is it still possible to embark on this journey? And I would say yes. It would definitely take a different form from a farmer in a field, right? Which is what most information online or in books is geared towards. But there are some seed saving manuals for kitchen gardeners or home gardeners that you look up. Um, and they will give you a little information on how you can even begin. Um, I've actually put those in the resources that I will be sharing. And you can also look for your own. Um, there's also some really great podcasts um, where uh, people are constantly sharing information about 
you know, their experiences with seed saving or, you know, plant breeding that they're doing very informally at home. So you could also look that up um, because that would be, you know, helpful. Um, I'm not going to go into how you can embark on this journey because that would be another 40 minute call and Twiffin will throw me out of here. <laughs> I hope. Um, okay, great. I love this next question. So why are some nice cherry tomatoes we brought um, do not, uh, that we have bought do not have seeds? So this is a great question. Um, there's also grape varieties now that you buy at the supermarket that don't have seeds. Um, there are also papaya varieties that you can buy at the supermarket that don't have seeds. And this is an active decision by people in seed companies and seed corporations so that farmers don't have access to those seeds then. So if I, right now, I could go to my kitchen and pick the papaya that I like, and I could be like, oh, I find this papaya really juicy. I'm gonna plant this papaya in my garden. I still have that option. But as soon as you breed papaya to not have seeds in it, I lose that option, right? So that's exactly what seed companies are, are trying to do you can breed indeterminate so you can breed that into a variety so that the seeds don't show up um so some people it, it's again it's about marketing you can pitch it as oh look now there's nothing getting stuck in your teeth or you know or you know uh, i don't know like now you don't have to worry about separating seed from your watermelon anymore right um, because if you notice some of these new varieties of watermelon, they don't have as many seeds um, compared to when I was a kid. I remember you'd eat one slice of watermelon and you were spitting out seeds like there was no tomorrow. So, do you, I mean, it's also part of the breeding process. I mean, it's, I like, I think, and I might be super cyn cynical, but I think that it's part of a bigger plan because again, you're taking away the opportunity for people who want to, to perpetuate it and continue it or take from it or borrow from it. Because I believe seeds are commons, right? That's my fundamental belief. I don't think anyone gets to own seeds, especially if you're the one who's been saving it and, and doing this for maybe generations of the plant and generations of your own family have been doing it. Um, how do you use pest presentatives like salt, neem leaves, or bury your seeds in these, or just have it beside or in the same container? Yes, sorry, I didn't go into this. Um, basically, if you have a jar, right, you have a jar and you've actually put your seeds in here, um, you will have to figure out the quantities because I, in Singapore, I probably would not recommend using salt because of our high humidity. So this was just a general thing that we could tell farmers living up in the mountains or where it was not as humid. But um, in Singapore, I probably wouldn't use salt. I would use dried chilies or I would use dry neem leaves or I would go to Teka Market and buy camphor crystals. Make sure you buy natural camphor and not chemical camphor. Um, so there's a difference. Um, and when... Camphor, you literally just, they're these little, little small crystals. You can just put one or two in your container. If it's a, a large like jar, like a, a glass jar size. Um, and if you're going to be using chilies, I would put about two to three dried chilies, about the same. The idea is that they should be a strong smell because it's the scent that actually keeps the pest away. So um, that's the deterrent. I'm not saying there won't be any pests. I'm saying it's a deterrent. Um, Okay, so I was actually not, um, this question that is next is, what are your experiences of seed sharing in communities and how does it help build community spirit? How can people do more to facilitate that? So um, this is a great question, except I was working on the farm. So I didn't get to do, I wasn't one of the coordinators that traveled out and worked with farmers. I did meet farmers who came to our farm for the trainings. So that's the difference. I was mostly working with the interns, the volunteers, and actually coordinating the international workshops that used to happen at our farm. So we still did seeds sharing on our farm, but in communities, I was not involved with that. So I've done it informally in Bombay and then not so much here in Singapore because I haven't been able to save seed here. I don't have space. Um, but um, I would say that it depends on the values of the community of also who are the community elders and the leaders, um, because that ends up being a big either proponent or deterrent of these practices. So, uh, and I'm also talking mostly from what I would hear from the other coordinators who would go out to communities and work with farmers is it really depends on 
who is the village head and who is the leader? What are their values and systems like? Are they a big proponent for traditional knowledge and seed saving? Then they would organize seed festivals, like once a year during the time of harvest, there would be a food festival and then there would also be seeds available and people would be swapping seeds quite informally. But whereas if the community leaders, it was not on their agenda, um, there was no priority given to it. So a lot of like festivals would be centered around cricket and not that cricket's not important, it also builds community, but it's just, it's a different focal point of community building, right? So if there, different people choose different avenues to build community. And so there were certain political leaders who would also then use, I don't know, like a market where they would bring stuff from outside because they felt like that was promoting commerce with other villages, right? So it really just depends on leadership, especially at the community level, because what happens is farmers are really busy. Like farmers are doing a lot. Like farmers have animals to take care of. They have plants to take care of. They have families to take care of. In their families, they have like three generations living in one household. So it gets, there's so many layers for a farmer to be managing and, and leading. So it ends up often falling on community leaders and political leaders to facilitate these things or nonprofits. So it again, depends on the presence and who has a higher presence in the community and then what values they're promoting. So um, I think it really depends on the, the primary values of the community and it's very hard to make generalizations. I've been to villages just visiting where there was no interest in traditional knowledge or traditional agriculture techniques, methods, um, you know, uh, culture. But, uh, and they were, the focus was on having kids go to engineering school or become a doctor, you know. So a lot of kids were leaving the village to go study, which was also a valuable thing, sure, right? So it's just, it really depends on what values and focus each community gives priority to. So it's very hard to make generalizations. Um, but honestly, I mean, going to foodscape events, uh, collective events, and other events also over here, are some of the farmers markets, there's a lot of sharing that happens, right, in these spaces. So I think if you create the spaces, people will flock to them who are interested. And hopefully, that will lead to cross pollination across their networks, right, like their own personal networks, or their work networks, or their family networks. Right. So if you've been to a cool event, you will go mention that to your friend. Right. So, I mean, I kind of feel is if you create the space, if there's people interested, it begets diversity, like I said. So diversity begets diversity. So I think so. Um, yes. Um, so there is one seed bank that I know of. There's a question. Is there a seed bank in Singapore? I only know, I mean, I don't know about people's personal collections um, because of course I know that there are people who do save seed. Um, Mr. Tang is uh, a really good resource in that because he's been saving many varieties of seeds himself in his different gardens and, and, and spaces that he's been growing on. But I know that people also do it informally in their own home. Um, I know people who get some CSA baskets and then have just tried saving like avocado seeds and papaya seeds or watermelon seeds and just planting it in pots. But see, that's again, it's just, it's a beginning of the process, right? At least you learn from doing, doing something. So um, I don't know if there is a specific um, collective of seed, seed savers. I haven't seen that yet here in Singapore. Um, there's definitely, I mean, I would like to think if something we could create. Um, there is one organized seed bank at the Botanical Gardens. Um, I haven't had the chance to visit yet. I have had a friend who got to go on a tour because she works at the government. But um, yeah, it's great. Someone has put the link. Thank you, Francis. Um, you're doing my job for me. Um, I can actually also add that to my resources link if anyone wants. I'll just copy that and put it in now. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if it was open during Circuit Breaker. I'm not sure. Um, but I think now as things open up, I think that Seed Bank will again be open to visitation. Um, I, from what I understand, it's only about a year and a half old. So it's still quite new as well. Uh, I don't know if it's cryogenic, which means it's frozen seed or if it's a living seed bank. I don't think it's a living seed bank. I don't think they're planting every season. Um, but I don't want to assume that they're not so because that's not fair either. 
Um, yeah, I have gone way over time. Uh, I hope I've answered everyone's questions sufficiently. Um, you can email me. I'll also put my email on the, I'll put my email on this chat, but I will also put it in the resources. So if anyone wants to email me um, and just chat about seeds, I'm always happy to do that. Ooh, Han Tong is saying that the Catholic Church of St. Ignatius has a seed bank too. I would love to visit. Could we organize a group visit? That would be so cool. We could do like a field trip together. If anyone's interested, tell Twiffin. <laughs> um, I think that would be really fun because then we could all learn together and also ask questions together because that means that they have knowledge local, right? Which would be great because I have only very informally done a little seed saving at the farm I was working on. I don't know if anyone, or if we have time and Twiffin will let me, um, if anyone has saved seeds and would like to share their experience here, that would be really great. That was part of, I thought that would be cool if there was time. So if we have time, um, Twiffin let me know, that would be great. I would be happy to hear someone else talk about seed saving in actual Singapore. Um. I wonder whether we could take that as a separate session because yeah. I noticed that maybe three people have left the call already and I think it's close to dinner time. Um, so if we draw this uh, session to a close, perhaps, yes, let's uh, organize a session to visit the seed banks and also have a separate session where other people can also share your experience on seed saving. Um, and yes, let's thank Aditi um, YC and Sangeeta for making this call possible um, and shall we everybody who wants to switch on your video um, shall we take a nice group photo before we end this call <laughs> Qingwei is uh, horizontal on my screen <laughs> Is everybody switch on? All right. Okay. One. Thanks for joining everyone. Two, three, cheese. Okay, I think I got everyone. Thanks everyone. I'm very sorry for going over time. Um, thank you for staying for the whole hour. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from any of you. All right, thank you everyone.